back in the early 50s, actually about 1950, uh, I was in New York City. I lived in Maine, had a laboratory there, was doing animal work and human work and Faraday cage and so on and so on. And I was young, I didn't know that much, you know. A lot of brass but not knowledge. So one of the things that happened was I was in New York City and I went to a reception given by a very famous lady in parapsychology at that time named Mrs. Eileen Garrett. And she had as a visiting guest from uh, India a nice little guy in a narrow jacket and so on uh, with glasses and you know, it could have been anybody's uncle. It was no something conspicuous. And he was very quiet, and uh, we met in the corner, and I asked him, you know, what he does. He's from the University of Kona, and he's here on a peace mission, and so on, and so on. And he said, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm studying parapsychology. I'm trying to find out the ultimate reaches of the mind, so I can finally design a brain. I mean, that's what my head was in those days, right? And uh, so he said, well, we must get together. I said, how long are you going to be in the country? Oh, he said, I'll be here for about six months, and maybe I'll get a renewal. I said, fine, I'll get together with you. Well, I left them and other events intervened and six months went by, a year went by, and every once I think, gee, maybe I'll call them up, but I didn't. So one day I was up in the uh, upper Westchester County area visiting with the former vice president of the United States, Henry Wallace, who was a good friend of mine. We did a lot of agricultural experiments together. And we got stuck a little bit on the statistics of an experiment we were running, so I missed the train. I was going to take back to New York City, and uh, I missed it by about two hours, and I did have an appointment in New York City. So he rushed me to the nearest town, which is Pleasantville, New York, known for Reader's Digest, put me on a train there, and I got on the train, and I sat down, kind of running all day, you know. And the last guy gets on the train, he comes late, and this is Dr. Vina. He sits next to me, he says, oh, he says, oh, time for us, you know, the Indians talk a little high-pitched voice, and say, oh, it's time we ought to get together, right? I said, you know, I guess so, we've been caught up with. Make a long story short, I invited him up to uh, uh, my laboratory in Maine, which is near Rockland, and he came in by plane, one of my colleagues had picked him up, he walked into the house, which is a very famous Stanford White place, huge, and walked into the library and sat down, and without giving us any warning, went into trance and started speaking. We are nine principles and forces, personalities that we wish, and we planned this to the altar of blah, 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 blah. And they start t telling us about who they were and what the history and if they're interested in helping us to further evolution, okay, that's how it all got started. And uh, so we got excited about this because it seemed like very high quality information, particularly the mathematics, which some of it to this day we have not solved. I might add almost 30 years later. And, uh, and I, I then began to learn about the big problem of peace and danger of nuclear war, and Dr. Vina took me down to Washington, and, taught me how to meditate on the whole congressional hall and, you know, how to calm their feelings of the president, blah, blah, blah. So I went this whole training period for about a year. And then my colleagues joined me. And Dr. Vina went back to India, and that was the end of, of talking to the man because he was so absorbed. I later found out from his wife and from his sons who went to Princeton and somewhere else to get PhDs, that uh, he had never done trans work. He was a religious leader besides being a professor uh, in India, but he had never uh, uh, done anything. The fact is, in the culture he was brought in, if he went into trance, was abhorrent. I mean, that was bad, bad stuff. It's like being a witch in a Catholic uh, church, you know? So they were surprised that he'd had this experience. So anything, anyway, 20 years went by, literally, and there was no word from the nine or anything happening. And then, as I told some of you about my trip to Israel, <coughs> finding out that Lori Geller was backed by an extraterrestrial of civilization, and he moved my <coughs> watch by just going like this over it. And then I began to get information directly at that point from the nine to the clock. But I didn't know it was information. All I know is the clock stopped and started. It took me from 19... 72 to 1975, about a three-year period to crack the code, and it turned out to be a 
rational code, and the reason I was sure it was the right code was that it was predicting events that would happen in the future very precisely, and I'd wait till the time came and events would happen. Try to gradually build up confidence. I didn't tell anybody about this until about 1978, and I began to talk about it to a few friends. And I finally released all the information about the nine and about the tapes and about the clock business in 1982. And that's the thing I mentioned to you earlier, if you want to get the tapes, you can uh, write for them. So my uh, association with these nine principles that run the universe, which they said you can think of us as God, but we're really not a single unitary you know, person. We're just principles, abstract forms. And we created the universe and we're destroying blah, blah, blah. And we did <laughs> all this sort of stuff. It's pretty heavy stuff, you know, to why Moses being talked to by Yehovah from the mountaintop. And uh, a lot of UFO contacts and experiences and uh, so on. So that, in a nutshell, that gives you a picture of what it's all about. Okay? There's a lot more to it, but that's the you uh, are the leaders of the nine. The, the Aleph, the beginning, and top, which is the end of the nine. And uh, they always sign the message if it's an important message. Sometimes they just they're given short information very short and it's not signed. But all the important stuff, particularly predictions for life on this planet are always signed. Thank you. Uh, you notice that it's a little awkward to talk about this thing because it's kind of a personal thing. And it's like somebody talking, telling you about their prayers. I'm not making prayers, but a lot of it is privileged communication. A lot of it is clearly stated this is secret and not to let anybody know it and so on. So but it's a continuing relationship, yeah, but uh, they the nine speak of the most important principle in the universe is free will. Nobody can override anybody's free will. And uh, for example, they tell me that uh, when I get this information from them. I'm free to act on it as I wish. I still have the free will, and that's very important. They also say they're not overriding my free will. They said, before I came into this life, I agreed to do this job. And so I'm just carrying out what I already agreed to. Nobody bent my arm. Free will choice. So the, the whole the situation is free will. For example, I've painted a rather dismal scenario that the uh, you know, nine had given me as to what's going to happen, and I've gone into some of the mechanisms. But they also say, a very recent conversation, that uh, mankind, and I mentioned this last night, has got so much potential in terms of what he can do, that he can override this whole scenario and there's no determination. He will make his future. But again, that in a way becomes a probabilistic or stochastic process and that it can't happen just because one person is going to do it, or 10% of the population. You've really got to get a majority of the people that say, we're going to do it, and we're going to straighten this thing out. Now, in a democratic society like ours, that's a no reason why if all of us decide to do something, no matter how impossible it starts, we can go out and do it. I mean, I'm absolutely convinced, and it's not wishy-washy thinking because one of my roles in the modern world has been to illustrate the power of the mind. That's why I've worked with these great psychic surgeons who carve you open and take pieces out and put pieces back in and people like Yellow who've done metal bending and others who do teleportation and dematerialization and so on and so on. So all these things are little indices which almost anybody can learn to do as we found out. <coughs> 